Um, so look, free trade agreements are an important mechanism to, to open the door to markets, uh, but uh, for trade to benefit all New Zealanders, it requires businesses to step through those doors, um, and that requires us to meet the exacting standards that these markets and, markets and consumers within, within them expect. Um, so we've got a perspective now from the sector on how our industry stays on top of the red meat export game. Joining us on the stage, we've got uh, three uh, esteemed uh, individuals. Fred Hallaby, the Managing Director of Hallaby, Wilson Hallaby. Uh, Jared Hickey, the Managing Director of First Light Foods. And Vili Weisser, Chief Executive of Alliance Group. Um, joining Van Gallis on stage. Moderating this session now is going to be the esteemed business journalist and trade commentator, Fran O'Sullivan. She needs no introduction. Uh, she's been a, a long, uh, long-standing commentator on, on all these trade and market access issues, and she will handle this panel with aplomb. Welcome, Fran. Thank you. No <laughs> um, look, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, we've just heard from Van Gelly uh, a story which is a little bit complex. Um, some choppy trade waters ahead, uh, nothing you can't possibly navigate, I imagine, um, particularly when the government is here to help. Uh, amid rising geopolitical tensions, greater protectionism, the issue of um, climate as well, as well as ongoing supply chain challenges. On top of that, we have an economic uh, cycle which is not friendly at the moment. Uh, it's adding pressure to prices and costs domestically, but also internationally in key markets. And at the same time, customers are becoming more discerning about what they put in their shopping baskets. Now, all of this makes for a very challenging environment and outlook for red meat processors and exporters over the next few years. So before we get into some of the more detailed questions, I'd just like to ask our panellists, um, this isn't the first time that New Zealand has faced challenging times, particularly in agribusiness. And each of you, no doubt, will have been through quite a bit of this before in various cycles. Uh, could you briefly each give a rating out of 10, 10 being best, as to how you see this sector's ability to navigate through current challenges and why? Starting with you, Billy. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Brian. Um, Alliance, like most other processors and exporters, are really finding the current trading conditions difficult. Um, not only necessarily for ourselves as a process and exporter, but also for our farmers. A lot of our farmers are doing it tough during these times as well. Having said that, there, there's a number of key drivers. Obviously, market price resets from late October, early November, and probably a sort of a mini reset um, year from May, June. Um, then China plays quite a big part. The, the, the role China plays is more specifically around slower recovery post-COVID but also consumer behaviour changes within China as well in terms of local versus imported con uh, consumer goods uh, and, and trading. On top of that, um, we've got additional pressure from uh, Australia as well. Significant volume, uh, organic growth in land specifically. This year coming from really good weather conditions just over a year ago. And it looks like that's going to continue into the next year as well. So all of those things you know, create a really volatile and uncertain trading conditions. Having said that, you know, when all these tailwinds that we've had for many years has turned into headwinds, it's highlighted obviously a lot of inefficiencies across the end-to-end -end value chain, but it's also identified significant opportunities for us to exploit and, and continue and build a stronger trade relationships and a, and a stronger economy. Taking that into account with the ingenuity of our New Zealand farmers, I would say we'll get through this, and I would score it about 8 out of 10, Fran. Wow, that's very optimistic <coughs> and uh, a good signal, I think, for the industry. Do you agree, Gerard? I do. Uh, 8 out of 10 was also the rating that, um, that I would give. And my perspective really comes from being one of the five exporters that have been involved in the venison industry for the last two or three years, where we've actually actually had a run-up to the current situation because we've been through a similar amount of pain. Um, and what we were able to do is to focus, is to diversify, to collaborate, and if we're looking at where the, the venison pricing is now, it's, it's dramatically improved and it's going to improve further. So um, I agree with you, Adam. Great. 
Can I move further in that category? Might even push it up close, huh? I think there's been a bit of a complex somewhere yeah. else on this. <laughs> but again, it's context. And in my case, it's context of being the old timer on the stage here. You know, if you go back to the 80s when I joined, we didn't have these FTAs to Asia. It was very much about a UK, Europe market and an American market. After that, it was a pretty dis you know, dismal scenario if you had the product. So the fact that we've got all these trade options is a significant adjustment. The other key point is, at that time in the 80s, the industry that was is the necessary platform to take us to the world was not in great shape. It was, uh, it was in excess of um, capability in the oil. Um, service providing and quite frankly meat companies weren't making money that's not a good scenario so I'd say the platform's way way better than what it was. Ah, helps to have had that long experience you've got something to compare it with and also to know that cycles will actually change. How do you see it Van Gelly? I think I see the sector uh, very much um, in, in with a good kind of plan I think I mean I'd, I'd, I'd say seven to eight um, <laughs> up to the guys here. Um, but just to say, um, I'd also then give a rating to the international environment. And I mean, there I do think we're in a sort of the three to four. So if you say the sector's reasonably well prepared, um, the problem with it is that, you know, a rating of seven to eight this year, you've got to sustain that every year. And that is the real challenge. So, you know, if we have this conversation next year, are we still confident that it's going to be seven to eight given the clouds that are out there? So I'd say seven to eight, but the international context is four and becoming a three. And I think really we are really needing to prepare ourselves for some really difficult times. Just look at softening demand in China. Yeah. Sobering. Anyway, uh, what are those issues out there? Sorry? But we have a plan. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so when speaking to the farming side, uh, we hear that real concerns about the pressure coming from regulatory change, and particularly in the environment space, which of course is so important also to the external perspective of our sector, as um, Van Gelly said before. Um, are we setting the bar too high for ourselves in these challenging times, or is it actually necessary that we step up to meet uh, the real world um, pressures? Who would like to take the lead on this? Maybe Jeremy. Oh, good, or, oh no, all right, really. That's a that's a topic close to my heart. Okay. Are we setting the bar too high? I don't think so. Are we confusing our farmers with regulation and ever changing conditions and calculations and permutations and making information available? Absolutely. We're making it really difficult for ourselves. Having said that, <coughs> New Zealand, obviously, as we all as we all rightly know has got one of the most efficient farming systems in the world. Yet we are not telling our story well enough as New Zealand Inc., as a sector and, and as a company. And there's definitely opportunities for us to do that significantly better. Having said that, there's a number of programs currently in play that if delivered well, will significantly change the environmental footprint. There is definitely a push from our customers market specifically the UK, but it will go out into the other markets as well for better environmental credentials. So I'm really excited about the space and there's a lot of good work um, in that space already happening. We just need to bring that to a close and have a very clear pathway, both from a regulatory perspective and a farmer perspective and create that alignment to get a better outcome. Gerard and Fred, I mean, what are you seeing from your customers, the expectations that they're now putting on you in the environmental space? pick up from actually we have quite a big local um, component to our business and uh, recently at Beef and Lamb Inc we were looking at Kantar research that generally shows the New Zealand consumer and public think very highly of our agricultural sector but it was a bit interesting in having just listened to our two previous speaker you know Gen Z, Gen Z are not as convinced as we'd like to think and there is unquestionably um, good support in, if you like, our traditional consumer group, but the youth of today are definitely putting us on notice that they want to know that we are doing something about environmental issues. So that's even in the, in the New Zealand context. Certainly offshore, uh, in talking to customers, say, in, in those wealthy European markets, they're absolutely aware of what the Brazilian meat supply issue is now. It's very much on the table as a hot topic. 
So yes, we're in a better position to be talking about it, but it's certainly a, a topic that's current and challenging. My experience is as uh, the premium end of the US market, uh, where we're selling to 1,200 high net worth individuals in a state club, we're selling to uh, end users, our own restaurants. So I think my view is unclouded by intermediaries. And there, if we're expecting our product to be worth more and more, which we are, um, we have to be ahead of the game. And so they're not specifically asking us today for these requirements. But we know it's inherent. We know it's going to come. And the, of them all, um, carbon and methane is, is, is what's the closest to mind. So if we want the highest possible price for our products, which we do, then we have to keep up. So we, we actually need to be ahead of the request. I mean, the, um, one of the issues, of course, is putting the price on emissions and um, the impact that that will ultimately have uh, in the longer term or the shorter term. Um, how are you preparing for this? And um, you know, is it forcing everyone to step up and make some uh, changes on emissions? Do we need to see more government investment in uh, perhaps methane inhibitors and so forth? Um, you know, how do you see it? Is this sort of something we should be making a, a big national uh, cause, or do we um, just reduce herd size, which some people are advocating for? And yes, I would definitely not support reducing herd size. Mm. I think we've been doing that over many, many years. But there's definitely, you know, whether, whether we ultimately get to an emissions tax, uh, uh, there's a long way before we get there. There's such a lot of good work that farmers have already done, and there's significantly more that we can do working and partner, partnering with government, uh, the government of the day, or potentially the next government, to get these outcomes. But to go to a tax up front, and then work through the rest is not necessarily making really good sense. I support Billy's view. You know, a, a tax is not going to take us anywhere. I think it's, it's important. Uh, you have one second, and there's talk about it, scope three emissions. Um, but, but in essence, simplify it, farm level, measurable, quantifiable, for one relatively simple system of what's required. There's still a lot of too much complexity. Mm. And Gary, I mean, you know, we are seeing uh, in trade agreements now that this, you know, cold hard reality of what other nations expect is actually coming into play. I mean, how do we navigate through this? Um, what's the expectations out there for the red meat sector? So, I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to claim to have a, you know, a a clever view on the consumer or anything like that. All I can tell you is that from in a negotiating context and in, in my appearances in front of the British Parliament and the, and the EU Parliament, um, you know, I mean, we estimated that over 80% of the questions we were getting were about environment and climate change. Not about the benefits to the UK consumer or the European consumer of having high quality product, but about, you know, how could we be confident that uh, New Zealand was meeting um, uh, the same kinds of standards as, as Europeans. Now, what I was struck by, because um, each of those meetings took an enormous amount of preparation, was we have very, very good material to draw on, but we need to keep it going. It's not, my, my main message is we can't rest on our laurels and assume that what was okay last year is gonna be enough for next year. It, it isn't. And my worry is that we think that we're okay and then two years down the track discover that boom, we're not. It's really important to remember these free trade agreements that we negotiate, they'll be reviewed. When they reviewed, when they get reviewed, they go back in front of the parliament. And as the Mexicans and the Chileans have discovered, that parliament then wants to hear a lot more. So the Mexicans and the Chileans had a free trade agreement with the Europeans. It's now sitting with the, two, with the parliaments there. And the questions they're being asked are, what are you really doing on climate change? What are you doing about your um, environment regulation of your dairy sector in nitrate? Uh, in water quality. So I was quite struck that this is increasingly a feature. So we have a good story. We need to, it needs to continue being one. One of the really powerful mechanisms we have is that um, I, I can remember my first appearance saying, look, we're going to send you a whole set of links. And we did. And that provided a really impressive data set. So that when they came back the second time, they acknowledged, 
First of all, that what I said, <laughs> what I said was true, but B, it was verifiable. And in a parallel track, another country was doing, uh, was trying to get its agreement ratified. It got stuck because it could not prove with science, with the transparency, with that availability of the data set. I think the other thing we've got to acknowledge is that lots of people are watching what happens in New Zealand, and some of them have got genuine environment concerns and climate change concerns, but some of them would quite like to use this as another reason to keep New Zealand product out. Let's not give them that excuse. I mean, I am fascinated to discover how interested German and French farmers have been in our climate change record. And the cynic in me says, that's not because they're really interested in the environment climate change, they're really interested in limiting competition. So there's, a, there's some cynicism in there, we need to acknowledge that, but we absolutely need to keep, keep moving on this and have that narrative of credible, transparent, science-based, and keep, keep that moving. And as I said, I don't have a view on the consumer thing, that's not my area of expertise, but just these parliaments, they are really gonna get tougher and tougher. Thank you. Um, looking at our trade strategy, it has been to grow our FTA network, and you touched on the Spangeli before that you know seventy-five percent of our export goods are now covered uh, by FTAs. Um, your perspective here, given changeable trade environment and our FTA network reaching full maturity, what do we do to get greater value out of these markets? I mean, I'd say I make a couple of observations. We haven't yet got the you know, we're, we're only assuming the EU one comes, we're going to get 74, 75. We really do need to get that up to sort of the, the close to the 90s to have that improved coverage. And then we also need to acknowledge that in the free trade agreements themselves, there's some patchy outcomes um, that have not have been discussed here already. So um, I think the observation is that we've got to acknowledge that these FTAs, they're not static, they get reviewed. So the China FTA was reviewed three years ago and upgraded, the ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA, uh, the signature of the upgrade will happen. There are opportunities to upgrade these agreements. I mean, the EU free trade agreement, the UK free trade agreements, they will be reviewed. They will be updated. The EU free trade agreement, for example, has a clause in it that says six months after entry into force, we'll meet, we'll talk about it. And then within a year and every year thereafter, there's an opportunity to revisit and review. To do that, you know, we've got to keep moving on those. We've also got to look at what those other opportunities are out there. So for example, what's on in the Middle East, what's happening with unfinished business with the Pacific Alliance, but clearly India and the United States are the, big, uh, are the big missing pieces for us. And at some point, we're going to have to think about what we're going to do about Africa. But in the meantime, I come back to that OECD stat, 40%. Losing 40% of the value of a free trade agreement through poor implementation, we simply cannot afford that as a nation. We simply can't. Mm. It's positive. Um, We've also been hearing regularly from government and elsewhere that New Zealand's <coughs> over-reliant on the Chinese market. Um, some 30 to 40 per cent of New Zealand produced red market is going there. And what are your respective views? And perhaps starting with you, Billy, given your company's tie-up uh, with the Chinese shareholder. <coughs> Fran, I think we just need to keep this a, a bit into perspective. Uh, China has significantly different opportunities for different sectors within, uh, within and across New Zealand. We have developed a partnership, uh, with a strategic partnership with a distributor for over 20 years and it's really served us well. Having said that, we have at the same time built alternative channels to give us flexibility in terms of, of how we move product or where we move product, taking all geopolitical tensions and outcomes into account. However, there is still a, a segment of our product offering that is that we don't really have a home for and that only really China consumes at this time and more will continue into that space. But at Alliance, we see China still as a really good trading opportunity, trading partner. We see ourselves in there for the long term. However, having said that, we are evolving our product offerings into that market. Um, to ensure that we keep extracting value and not necessarily do that through a volume increase. Uh, Fran, our company doesn't sell into China, so I don't have a perspective on that. But, but I think one thing I would add, given all the good work that Bengali and Impact do, is that every market is obviously as much bigger than just perhaps what we all think. And in a US exa example, you've got digital, you've got retail, you've got food service, you've got your own restaurant sectors. 
So I think we can go a lot deeper in the markets that we've already got access to um, to strengthen ourselves and improve our revenues on a per kilo basis as well as new markets. And I think one other perspective was um, when China got COVID and that market effectively fell out of the buying cycle. It was interesting just how much the rest of, of Asia picked up those, those products. Um, not at the same money, so that's the attraction of China. It, you know, it does pay for the product ranges that it specifically looks for, but I, we're not obviously dealing in the scale that Billy's company's dealing with, but certainly the ability to work our way through the Thailands, the Philippines, um, that Southeast Asian, plus the Korean and Japanese network. So that there is a lot of marketplace to work with. There's a question here from the floor which um, also talks about China. It says it's considered the greatest uh, threat to Australasian Pacific regional security. And how would the red meat sector fare if this worsens? Um, and this is with the fire ice tie up and so on. Anyone want to have a crack at that? It's a difficult one. Yeah. Isn't it? but, I, but I think Jared has, has answered it to some extent. And, you know, in, in one way we've got Angeli giving us um, the trade perspective, the other one is the product perspective. And our challenge is to, to tell or to convince the world about the benefits of the grass fed beef program. Because you know, a lot of the world beef markets are now grain finished, but we know that there is a story around our, grain, our grass finished beef. Um, that's the tragedy of not a better um, agreement with the EU because that's a market that understands grass. But you know, North America is interested in grass fed and it is a very big market. So it's that diversity that we, I think we need to bring. And Gary? Just to make a. Um... <laughs> People will know I'm of Greek origin, so let me indulge me a bit um, by, you know, the Peloponnesian War 2,500 years ago, story of these two big cows, um, and I know some of you have heard this story before, and I tell it to my group all the time, my team, because uh, they have to listen to me. The, um, uh, the island of Milos was a small island state um, during the time of the Peloponnesian War when um, Athens was the rising power and Sparta was the status quo power. And Milos had a military relationship with Sparta, it was a former colony of Sparta's, but it was a major exporter of high quality pottery. And Athens was the only place that was buying it because the Spartans with their warrior culture weren't interested in, um, in, in beautiful things. Um, Milos determinedly tried to sustain its relationship with Athens, but also with Sparta and argued that it should have the space to do that. The Athenians eventually got sick of this and they turned up with a fleet and an army on the island of Milos, uh, which incidentally is only two islands along from the island I'm from, and they arrived and there's something very famous called the Melian Dialogue. And in the Melian Dialogue, the two sides, the Athenians and the Melians, the people from the island of Milos, explain their positions. And the dialogue runs for about four pages, it's worth Googling. And it is a very instructive lesson because in there, there comes a moment when the Athenian general says, Stop. The strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. They then attack the millions, they kill all the men, they enslave the women and children, and we don't hear about the island of Milos for 600 years. My point is, we must not get trapped into a million dialogue situation with those major powers. So the answer here is about management and mitigation. It is not a get out of China, get out of uh, the US or anything. It is a manage and mitigate, be aware of the risks. I did talk about what happened to Australian wine exporters, Australian barley exporters. Be in no doubt about how brutal the geopolitics of this is getting. Mm. Just uh, following on from that on, on the FTA space, um, a question which asks with the US focusing more on Asia Pacific, does that increase the chances of the FTA at all between New Zealand and uh, the US? Yes, no? Is that to me? Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, of course I'm the eternal optimist. Um, yes, I mean, I do think that we need to find ways in which to engage the United States. Look, for me, um, and you won't be surprised, um, I'm sure David uh, Walker, who was responsible for TDP, and me for CPTPP, we, I mean, I'd like to think we both think that the way back for the United States is through CPTPP, because that does give us market access, and that is what is missing from the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is the 
frame that the United States is pursuing at the moment. However, we do need to be working with the United States in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to make sure they're in the region, and we need to be finding ways to have that dialogue with them across those things, because so, they are a key, a key commercial partner and a key partner full stop. Okay. Coming back to our exporter industry uh, representatives here, uh, what are the challenges you all face when it comes to communicating the sustainability advantage, and what can we do about that? There you go. <laughs> no, come on. Well, there you go. No one knows. <laughs> and this, this specifically the New Zealand sustainability yes. advantage, yes. I think there's a great opportunity. I think obviously a lot more work to be done just to, to, to not only necessarily in specific programs that's currently run out of New Zealand through, through very different um, sectors and specifically the red meat sector as well. Uh, However, there's a lot more that we can do to back up that story with real measurable attributes. There's a number of key programs in play at the moment. FAP Plus comes to mind. There's a, a real focus on scope three emissions, scope one and two. I think the challenge for us to get there quicker, to tell that story quicker is more where I would be focusing on. And that's where better collaboration with the government needs to take place, to have more proactive programs in place to facilitate an outcome quicker. Right now, we find that industry might be moving scope one. I saw that mm -hmm. clearly as we were significantly moving and decarbonizing in scope one, we found ourselves um, out of touch with infrastructure to keep up, which slowed us down. We're gonna find similar uh, uh, opportunities and, and, and stepping stones and stumbling blocks within the scope three uh, um, areas as well. We've already seen some of it. Having said all of that, I think there's a great opportunity to significantly reduce our environmental footprint. And it's not, it's not an and or friend, it's an and and. And the opportunities are there to coexist and get to a better sustainable outcome. We actually have to get there, it's just the right thing to do. It's just how we get there in a coordinated, controlled adult way, instead of flipping and flopping like we're doing from time to time. Seems to be one of the answers, doesn't it, to the position we find ourselves in. We're working that same issue on the domestic market because that's obviously a, a good proving ground. And the issue there is that we've historically had sort of a, a Q mark, which you're probably all familiar with, the quality mark. But we now recognise that that label needs to, that, that mark needs to carry an environmental component. Um, so advanced discussions on how the Taste Pure Nature um, uh, program can be connected with the quality mark. And obviously that leads into some New Zealand farm assurance programs that satisfy a consumer at a certain level of um, environmental sustainability in place. So we're working that through as we go. A final and quite tough question from the audience, um, as a number of these recent ones have been. Uh, do we risk trading our social licence in feeding 40 million globally if um, we're struggling to feed 5 million at home? I think we've all got a responsibility individually and collectively to look after those at home. So I think we're all doing it in our own way and, and it's going to be increasingly important that our social conscience is visible, is authentic and is carried out. We can't do both. We have to do both. Too. Thank you. I think I'll end at this point because I can feel Mark Peterson coming up behind me, <laughs> eyes in my back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, look, there's a huge number of uh, questions on this um, iPad here, so I, I would hope that the organisers will put them through to you all and you could all take the opportunity to respond at leisure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Don't go anywhere, team. We're just going to um, now just invite Martin Taylor from Eurofins, who sponsored this session, and one, another one of our wonderful sponsors, to say a few words, and then I'll close off the end of the session, and then we'll break for morning tea. So, Martin, thank you. Good morning. It's been a great uh, session this morning. It's certainly reassuring to me that I am living in the future because I've just, my teenage son is always on his phone and it never rings. Um, thank you to this uh, team uh, and on behalf of Eurofins, it's great to sponsor this conference and to continue our partnership with the red meat industry. 
Eurofins provides laboratory testing services to the meat processing sector. We are really local with our network of labs across uh, New Zealand and truly global with access to leading developments in science. Uh, that never cease uh, to amaze me. Uh, please enjoy your morning tea and thank you to the team that presented and for the session that we just had. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thanks again for your kind sponsorship. So, look, I just want to thank everyone involved with the panel and Fran uh, for your moderation. Uh, well done for that.